Council, I, I'm, I'm in full belief that the council are about to take action upon these items and just want to make sure that if you feel like you you and your team are comfortable with this. I know you have parts of your team all across the country and that we're, I know we're excited and just want to make sure that you're ready for us to take action. Oh, we are ready to go. We have, we have uh, the, the lawyers have run up enough fees okay. that we can now, I think, get this verbal junk. <laughs> Mr. Rutter, Schuler's attorneys in the audience, I've seen chuckling, George, so <laughs> perhaps, perhaps he still has some more faith for you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion from counsel in the matter of the master development agreement with the Schuler development. Mr. Johnson, I move that, that the development agreement is presented and reviewed in executive session between the city and the various landowners of interest known as the Schuler development be approved and the mayor be authorized to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Hanley, second from Councilman McClure, all in favor by saying aye. 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 Both like sign. Motion carries. In the matter of accepting the deed without warranty from the United States government. Mayor Johnson, I move that the deed without warranty from the United States of America to the city of Denison conveying approximately 600 acres of land sales price of 1.85 million be accepted as presented that the mayor be authorized to execute the acceptance the deed execute the acceptance of the deed and the substance and form presented and the city manager be authorized to deliver to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the accepted deed along with the city's payment and certified funds for the purchase price to the appropriate party within the USA uh, Corps of Engineers. Further I move that it complete the city's conveyance of the property to the parties of interest in the Shuler Development Group. I have a motion from Councilman Hanley, second from Councilman McClure, all in favor by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. <coughs> in the matter of authorizing the creation of one or uh, two or more uh, mud districts. Mayor Johnson moves that ordinance number 4679 authorizing the creation of two or more municipal utility districts within the city and its extraterritorial jurisdiction pursuant to the language of the ordinance as presented. I have a motion from Councilman Hanley. Second. Second from Councilman Brawley. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. In the matter of creating the tax increment reinvestment zone, there will be no action taken. In the matter of declaring surplus property. Mayor Johnson, I move that, four, that 40 acres in the northwest corner of the Lake Randall property be declared surplus property. That the city council instruct the city staff to proceed to bid and sell of the property at terms advantageous to the city and that all bids received following advertising, advertising and public notice be returned to the city council for consideration. Second. I have a motion from Councilman Hanley, second from Councilman Beck. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries. Uh, George and, and team, just a, a few comments from the city. As uh, as you mentioned, we, we as a community have been working um, with you for over 12 years on this development and to get something this big done it takes a lot of people and you mentioned you, Mayor Lindsay who I see started this and I'm certainly glad that he, he's here. Mayor Brady and 12 councils along the way have, have had the pleasure to get to work with your team. Um, it took the United States Congress, Texas State House of Representatives and the Grayson County Commissioners and of course 12 councils to get us to this day, all taking various actions throughout those years. And, and what the community needs to know that, that the city council of those 12 years certainly did not take their responsibility lightly. This is a big deal. This is a, another city within our city. And when fully developed, this development has the potential to be an additional $1.9 billion on our tax rate. Again, I, I want to say that because it's important to know it's one a potential of $1.9 billion when fully developed. To get that to happen, there's over $200 million of public infrastructure that has to be put in by the developer in order to have that return. Potential homes are over 4,000 homes, which could equate to eight to 10,000 additional people living in our fine city. And so again, the, the work and the effort has culminated tonight. We still have work to do, um, but the, the heavy lifting has been concluded. And again, I want to thank staff, um, Tom Akins and Mr. Hanna, uh, for their leadership on this. And, and it's just a pleasure to be a part of this Monument Day in Denison. Well, I think we have uh, uh, images of what that that peninsula will look like, what that lakefront will look like, what that community will look like. Well, one thing we'll be saying, it'll be called Denison, Texas. And we're excited to be a part of that. So um, we're going to
going to move into the next agenda item, but again, want to thank George and his team, and, and certainly want to to lead in a, in a round of applause for a monumental day.
we're really excited about it. I think uh, I, I think that, that we'll have lots of, of, of interest. Um, they are these type of festivals uh, are done all over the country, and some in, in very remote areas, and, and end up with with uh, you know six or seven hundred or a thousand people you know attending. Um, the other thing that's great about it is it, it does promote some healthy living. Um, all these folks are very committed to their their sport, and uh, we're we're also interested in that as well as the fact that it can uh, bring some of our citizens that they don't see on a regular basis. And there will be parts of this that, that are projected to be very spectator friendly, also in our downtown area, um, in, in an event similar to Bike the Bricks in McKinney for those who have been to that. So we really feel like this is a great mix of, of different things for, for everybody, those who are sport enthusiasts, those who want to see something different, and also um, to let people see what a great area we live in and uh, for you know, their future. So, very good. Thanks. Question, counsel? No action taken tonight, correct? Yes, that was informational. Very good. Uh, we'll move back to the consent agenda, agenda item number three. Mayor, I move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. A motion and from Councilman Beck, second from Councilman Hanley. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Black sign. Motion carries. Agenda item number four, public hearing. Uh, receive a report on 2801. Uh, West Morton, Ms. Brock. Mayor Sam, so we have a letter from Mr. Clay. Um, he has withdrawn his request. Yeah. So in the withdrawal, there will be no action taken. Uh, agenda item number 5A, general election May 11, 2013. Ms. Walton. We have an ordinance in front of you calling the election for May 11, 2013. It's Saturday. We have Thank you. 
requirements set spacing, setbacks, and everything uh, for billboard signs in that district. So basically what that's going to do is it's going to require probably two or maybe more billboard signs to be removed in order to put up one digital billboard. So it's kind of a trade-off. Many other cities have done that. They've come back and allowed contractors to um, trade off so many uh, regular billboards for digital billboards. And we felt like this is following that. It just also answers that question and clears it up. So that was the, the last issue that we made a change on. If you have any questions, I'll try. Thank you. Okay. I've got a few and I, as I was going through this, I was concerned a little bit about the engineering studies. Uh, I didn't see any clarification in that. Is what point the current signs require to have an engineering study? It's uh, for pole signs that are more than 10 feet tall. And if you look under, um, I believe it's under the on-premise pole sign regulation. Um, that's, that, that's fine. So anything over 10 feet, the idea behind that, uh, that's kind of a cutoff that a lot of cities use. And the reason for that is once you get up to that height, the wind pressure is higher because there's less uh, friction on the ground, there's less to block the wind, and so it tends to be a little bit higher above the ground like that. The uh, other question I had about pole signs in particular, there was some wording also about grade level measurements from the grade level. I've seen it's from the base, not from my particular office is located on down the slope of Moore Street. If I were to measure from the level of my dirt, uh, I may not be able to get above visible uh, slide on Moore Street. So there's consideration of the road taking into effect. How does the ordinance address that? Typically it's just measured from the ground below or where the pole is located. And if there's mitigating circumstances there, such as it's lower than the street or something of that nature, then we would, um, uh, that would be an option for a variance. Uh, the variance requirements are, because we've moved it over to the building appeals board, uh, they're less restricted because you don't have to prove a hardship. And there is um, four criteria that you would utilize and as long as you meet three of those four criteria, then you would um, be eligible to get a variance. And if you would, Mr. Jackson, I, and I apologize, I'm not really clear on what the visibility triangle is. That is measuring from the point of the intersection of the two streets where those two form uh, a point, the imaginary line. You would measure back 25 feet on either side and then complete the triangle, and nothing could be located within that area. And the purpose for that is at the intersections, you want it to be open so that cars can see who's coming or, or moving down the street, not pull out in front of someone. So we'll have the application for that fire that's not the same problem. Correct. It basically what it says is that if it's a pole sign and it's 10 feet tall between the ground and the bottom of the sign, you're exempt from that visibility triangle. But if it's a monument sign that's put at ground level and it's going to block that area, I believe it's 
there are some places such as a grocery store that put they put up numerous things um, and, and they'll put up groceries um, pharmacy drugs all kinds of things and, and the intent was to declutter that space so that that audience just had the <coughs> difference Body of signs, I think we would go to the extent of saying that it would be uh, not the same material as the building. Again, maybe those little buildings on um, more I would encourage them not to do the same. Some of the wording, I guess, concerning the building. And I know there's a difficult task on marketing but we seem to put more instead of uh, allowing some things to, to pan out, I guess is my concern. Uh, one, one more clarification, Robert, if you don't mind. The, the distance from the property line, and that's always the $99 question when you've got a decent. So when you say 15 feet from the property line, you're talking about the curve, but actually, for example, my property on, on more 15 feet from the road or 15 feet from the city's um, right away. Well, typically when we put the property line, we're talking about the, uh, the section where the property line or the property actually starts for your property. So went back to the curb line, then it may not even get outside of the right-of-way, because there are some right-of-ways that are, that are wider than that. So most of them usually run between 10 to 12 feet, but, um, but there are some that have more than that. So the long answer to that is we are talking about um, not the curb line, but where your property starts. So my sign is illegal as it is right now.
clarify as far as where a business owner, if they have their, if they're advertising on their vehicle, where they can park their car? Did we get that clarified? We didn't change the ordinance on that area. The, um, the intent of that was, and I think what I said last time was, uh, such as Mr. McClure, he, if he's parking in his parking space, well then he's parking in his parking space. There's not much parking space there to park in. However, if somebody was at Mortar Street Plaza, and they were in the back part of that shopping center, and they were parking at the street with a huge sign on a panel thing and saying, um, you know, Barry's Booths, the, we don't feel that that would be in compliance with the intent of the ordinance. They're parking there to, to attract the, the attention of people using the right of way. They're not parking there because that's a commuter vehicle that they're driving back and forth to work, and they're parking in front of their store. They're parking five, six hundred feet away. And in that situation, we would notify them that that's a violation of the ordinance. Well, I think it's meant for, for, for some of you here, it's like, for instance, on Main Street, there is no private parking, so I mean, everybody's parking. Well, I shouldn't say there's not any, there's mainly public parking. So if people are parked in front of their business there, that's yeah, not. Let me ask the question in a different way. I, I put a vinyl wrap around my truck that says Box City of Business and Water. And I park on my way to Walmart, I park in front of Walmart to find my groceries to come out and I drive back home and I park in my driveway and I come to work and I park in the city hall parking lot. None of that is a violation of the ordinance. If I go by a 18 wheeler and spray paint it and say buy this some water and I park it, you know, the 500 block of Morton Street and sit there, that would be a violation of the ordinance. A good example of this is Lane for Roofing. Everybody's seen his truck. He's got it vinyl with his attractive covering, but he's got it, he's advertising his vehicle. Nothing that he's doing is violating the city ordinance. He's going about his business. He just has his truck as a form of advertising. If he decided to park that at the corner of Austin and, and Gandy and let it sit there and never move it, that would be a violation of the ordinance. Is that the correct understanding, Bill? Yes. Yeah. Well, I see some concerns too, like with, with our construction sites. Anytime we have a major construction site, have, you know, every person who's working on that site is going to pull their 18 wheeler trailer in and then park them. You know, we have told them that's not in compliance. No, that's not the intent at all. Okay. If, if you're at a construction site, you have a legitimate trailer there, it's permitted, uh, it's identified by the, as the contractor who's doing that, it's not an issue. Okay. The, the issue is the big panel trucks that come in and park at the corners and they're, they're basically using an off premise advertising. Right. Okay. Same thing would go for with the panel truck that's got balloons. Yes. Even if it's parked in their parking lot, it's got balloons, obviously trying to, to be an advertising vehicle, then that would be stuff to be. I would say so. I mean, it's one thing if, if it was somebody's 40th birthday and somebody tied some right. balloons on it. It's, it's difficult sometimes to nail down an ordinance to the exact uh, regulation, and it's going to require some consideration and interpretation and, and common sense. And hopefully we're going to use that. And if we don't, well then we know that you'll be calling and saying, what's wrong with these people? Why are, why are they being unreasonable and how they enforce this? Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan. Motion to approve.
area along that tree line channel in there. That's the project, as, as uh, if you all recall that. Um, that completes the uh, close up of that. The uh, drainage ditch is identified in blue. Uh, it is uh, back of the uh, 10 lots uh, on the north side of that subdivision. Uh, the major damage uh, to that project was done on uh, lots four and five uh, as a result of some water coming in from the subdivision to the north and then just through erosion as the, the creek progresses back to the, to the southeast. Um, the first bid that uh, we uh, entered into a contract with George Cowman. George was the civil engineer that uh, did the design on the three um, options that we'll talk about tonight. Uh, option number one was the base bid. And the base bid was to install gabion baskets uh, along the uh, backside of uh, lots four and five. And for those that aren't familiar with gabions, they've, uh, they've been around. Uh, Textile is used them for years. Uh, this is the uh, a picture of the mat. This will be what is on the flow line of the creek. There will be a nine inch <coughs> mat there as wide as that creek is uh, filled with uh, nine inch or smaller rocks to keep that, the erosion down to a minimum. On top of that mat, then we're going to have baskets that are going to be placed. They're three foot uh, square and in various lengths along the, the, uh, the uh, channel. There'll be two baskets high uh, and they'll be staggered in uh, at the top. Uh, they'll again be filled with rock and that will prevent any further erosion along that creek line. Uh, the second bid, uh, the, the next picture is a picture of a typical basket once it's filled and ready to, uh, to be set into place. Uh, the first alternate bid that we talked about was the, uh, the, the installation of 60 inch and 72 inch concrete pipe along the back of all 10 lots. Uh, this project will, will tie into the existing uh, culvert under uh, park. Uh, it will run due east. There will be a junction box established at that point. Uh, and then from there, the 72 inch pipe will go the entire length of the rest of the subdivision. We'll have the uh, 30 inch pipe coming in from the north tie into it with the junction box at the point indicated there on the plan. And there'll be another small 18 inch pipe coming from Renaissance Park that will tie into that 72 inch uh, down around uh, lots, inch lot seven. And then at the end of that 72 inch pipe, there'll be a uh, standard type B head wall on the end of that. The second uh, alternate is to pipe just the area behind lots four and five to tie in the 30 inch pipe coming from the subdivision to the north and then a uh, 72 inch head wall on the, uh, on the end of that pipe there. Uh, we opened bids on October the uh, 5th, the base bid which uh, is the Gabion Baskets. Uh, the low bid on that was $153,512.09. The alternate number, alternate number one, which is to pipe the whole subdivision, uh, the low bid was $383,005.05. And the second alternate was to uh, pipe just behind lot four and five. The low bid on that was $128,763.20. We're also going to ask for authorization to pay the engineer $6,000 for the work that he did uh, designing the three alternates uh, once one of those options are selected by the council. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer those. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, as part of this <coughs> project, because uh, I actually went out and looked at, looked at this when, when we looked at this back in October, I just wanted to um, are we doing anything with the with the homeowner that is on the north side of that property that has created a extremely high pressure of water coming out into the into that creek? Or are we? It would depend on which alternate. Uh, the base bed, the Gabby Mascus, will end at lot five, as does the pipe. Uh, the only thing that will address anybody downstream. No, no, this is on this is on the north side of the so on the creek. The intake structure. This yeah, so on the yeah. Yeah, the down 
downfall where where all the problem was created from yes. one side. All that three would options will correct that. Okay. Problem. Yes. 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 I'm sorry. I got you. Okay.
rich. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be brought off guard. And, and your, your city clerk will like yeah, to speak yeah. But from the fact that I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'd be embarrassed. Over the years, you have leased your facilities, your, your elevated facility, for uh, uh, cell phone usage. And we have not had a request previously uh, for the leasing of space on your water towers for uh, wireless networks. Uh, there has been wireless equipment uh, on some city's facilities in the past that belonged to others, but that was uh, kind of an a, a exchange of services arrangement. This, that is before you tonight, is the first lease application that you have from a private entity desiring to uh, lease space on both the uh, airport water tower and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Parkdale, Park thank you very much, uh, tower. We don't have uh, a good feel for what the fair market value of that space is because the business dynamics is different for uh, the wireless network uh, business model than it is for the cellular model. After collab uh, collaboration among the staff, there's a recommendation that uh, you consider uh, the monthly rental for both towers to be at $500 per month. Uh, there was a picture in the agenda that shows the uh, type of equipment that would be hosted uh, on the two towers. And uh, one of the things that the only, I guess, uh, precautionary words that the staff had to offer was that all of these towers have a finite amount of space. Uh, and there's no doubt that in today's world, and who knows what tomorrow holds, that uh, the cellular array of antennas is, is more profitable to the city, it's worth more in the marketplace. Uh, so just be aware that every time you authorize an array of antennas <coughs> that uh, you're taking away precious space on those towers. With that being said, just wanted you to be aware of that, the staff recommendation is that you uh, favorably consider the application of technical communications uh, to place uh, their equipment on our towers at the rate of $500 and uh, during this process was in uh, regular communication with Ben Power to make sure that what was being considered or requested did not interfere, interfere with the primary use of Ben Power, that is, for your water supply. And we believe that we can accommodate them. One of the things that I uh, wanted to call to your attention is a small item, but it, it is important, is that we will be requiring as we do on cellular customers, that uh, this user provide their own electric meter. Uh, a prior user was not uh, uh, required to do that in the uh, wireless setting when we had a partnership with Internet Techzoma, but in this case, they will be providing their own electricity. That's not a big item, but it does make them stand alone. Questions? What's, uh, I recall when it started from LA, Council, we had, uh, I think, one or twice, two times. Uh, what was the, the fee that the other cellular companies are paying to us to use on the water tower? Uh, we're from 16 to 1800 a month. Uh, we've got uh, maybe about three different contracts, and uh, we have facilities on every uh, tower. Uh, I believe, uh, unless. Is, is there still a user on the uh, Tone Avenue structure? No, not in the you think they may have left. Yeah. Is that is that substantial amount more uh, amount of equipment? Is that a lot more? But usually I know that the uh, they would probably they <coughs> get three big long well, well, holes and we'll these things. They're just more money in the cellular okay. arena, and, and they do require more more land space to run the tower. Another question. Make a motion to approve the The motion for Councilman Hanley, second for Councilman Beck. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Both by sign. Motion carries. Agenda item 5G.
Gene, Enclosure Waterway Pool, Mr. Howard. Mayor and Council, this is a request for Council's authorization of a design contract with uh, Wright and Associates uh, to design a climate control multi-use uh, facility within the Waterway Pool. Whenever the pool feed started some 14, 15 months ago, uh, staff was encouraged to find a vision, look for opportunities to do more with the pool. We uh, certainly are uh, thankful for all the support that the pool has received, uh, the increased use of the pool, and the revenues that continue to, to climb. And, uh, much of that credit goes to our staff that's managing the pool and the maintenance uh, manager there as well. Uh, tonight's uh, activity is just the design contract. We've included some of the some elevations and just some planned views to kind of give you an idea. This was previously presented to the council and was prudent management for us to save for a year uh, before we started budgeting these funds. And uh, we're uh, certainly hopeful that we can do something maybe with staff's participation to keep this part of uh, this particular uh, facility closer to uh, $100,000 for Dining and viewing is the main room, plus a concession room and a, uh, a break room for lifeguards, which for everybody that's been at the pool, we have very, very limited indoor space for the number of employees that we have there. The other thing that we're hoping to have is some uh, offices upstairs uh, so that the people that are doing the work can see everything that's going on because basically they're in a, a modified storage building in the parking lot. recommending that you uh, support the or authorize the contract for another twelve thousand dollars. Question for council. So this is point of clarification. The the part that we're authorizing tonight is just the design part which then I guess would come back to council once the design has been flushed out or we would uh, request authorization to go out for bids and we would bring the bids back to the council. Okay. The so Council would have to prove any building project before it was <coughs> right. Yeah. Okay. And so this this would eliminate the that, that back corner of the building that we do in the in the back there. Was that the part that was created to break in at one time? Was that the part that was broken into? No, it was actually the, the front office. Front office. Or any of the councilmen that got to attend the uh, bill and McKinney on recycling. That would be a similar viewing for that facility there, for what it looks like. Would, would any of this, uh, the ability to have at the same time address some of the opening, <coughs> you know, we're having difficulty with closing and opening that uh, opening top, is there any way to have that part of this study to, to look at something that, to modify that at the same time? Because I know during the summer it almost becomes pretty difficult to close it, maybe our springtime and fall. That uh, really goes back to the original design of the opening mechanisms. They're really just glorified RV canopy opening devices. They were not designed for <coughs> the weight of those doors as they function. And when, and when the uh, enclosure was reskinned a couple of years ago, we looked at that in great detail with the contractor, and he agreed. Uh, credit to Mitchell Enterprises. They assist us with the opening and closing of that but the original design for that uh, was inadequate at best. And uh, we, uh, they, they come in and help us close and open that or whatever request we make. That's the back of the too. When, when it was originally built, it actually did function, but it warped over a very short amount of time, and for whatever reason, the city was not at that time. <coughs> well, to me, I just, I, just, I just question that it's going to spend that amount of money in that area to have it cool that we wind and we at the same time see if we can get this area addressed and also the opening and closing of that there are those seasons you know where it's winds up being cold and getting real hot at, at night to our day and take that at the same time. Like to tell her about that council you know I think the primary you know, my kids have since become very involved in the pool and I think it's really for the, the spectators. Uh, and the office workers, the, the ones that are swimming here are very comfortable, um, as long as it's not too uh, too cold. Uh, I assume we're opening and closing those at seasonal, uh, as opposed to daily, uh, which is certainly not uh, what you would hope. You hope you push a button and open and close, and depending on the day of weather. But uh, I think actually just providing the location for that visibility that we saw in the um, full of spectators and that is. Uh, 
large improvement in the pool and activity there from what I've seen. I uh, appreciate uh, the way that's handled. So I'm, I'm all for this. Would it be a very big cost or big difference for them to be able to, that company that would do that facility inside to look at that and explore and see what they do? Would it cost more than more money than $12,000 to actually look at that too to come back and give us some recommendations or alternatives to that? I think that's a, a whole different kind of company. And I think you'd have to redesign and build the system uh, in order in order to have a functional system where you can hit a button and, and have it work. And you're going to have to replace the mechanical components involved in doing that. And you may, because the tiles of the nature are a, a poly, they're, they're plastic. Polycarbonate. Yeah, polycarbonate um, tile. They're going to expand and contract and buckle with the heat. That's part of the problem. Um, Michael, when they open those up, they get on them with hammers and beat the heck out of them. You know? um, I, I guess I'm trying to, if we don't know what that number is, I'd like to know what that number is. $30,000 to sure. do it with pictures to make it correct, it, to make it right. Well, so <laughs> but I'd like to know what it is. We can certainly get that number for you. That is not a problem. We, we would uh, like to look at that possibly as a future maintenance contract, but uh, the fellow that provided the design for the enclosure originally brought that design with him and we have uh, uh, not had a real mechanical engineer look at this you know, as yet. We've continued to function with it the way it is. We, uh, we're very, I guess, familiar with uh, just the, the main changes in the season and uh, probably don't need to open it all that regularly anyway. But the, the, the heat of the building for that large of a structure really costs a lot of movement. And so it, it impacts how well those are going over. We'd like to give a hat tip to, to Betty Bridges, who's here tonight, and been doing a fine job. She and her staff are doing I'll make motion to approve the $12,000 design thing. A motion, Councilman Hammond, second Councilman Brawley, all in favor by saying aye. Aye.
there is there are some elements I I will, I will be admits if I don't draw council's attention to this uh, that we spent a large part of the discussion on it the last time it was before you. That is the public uh, park dedication requirements. I believe it's page ninety two ninety something. Um, and council's concern was that it does not be required for the developer that might build you know, a 10 acre or a 10, a 10, 10 unit subdivision, which is predominantly how Denison has grown. And so we put an exception requirement that unless you're building uh, 50 units or more, uh, you wouldn't have to meet uh, the land parking dedication requirements. Try to strike that balance. Again, um, parkland dedication, the, por the parkland dedication parts of the subdivision ordinance are an important part of the important part of the amenities that will be required to shoot development. And I think it's important to have something like that, and you will find that a uh, number of communities, not all, but a number of communities have parkland dedication requirements in their subdivision ordinance. Uh, and it, it goes back to council's priority to create a livable community, community that attracts and retains and young families. But that is something that the uh, council did have some discussion on. I'm not even but I didn't mention that it was included, but we had some changes to it that hopefully reflect council's direction.